to talk to us about what he's up to these days, uh, which has to do with workforce and uh, professional development. Uh, and there's also slots available this afternoon meeting slots if you want to sign up to do that. Thanks a lot, Janelle. Um, um, so I'm really pleased to be there and I'm really pleased for the opportunity and as Janelle said, um, if anyone's curious about supermassive black holes and the kind of work I used to do, just ask Janelle because she does more and better of it and she can, she can inform me of everything that I've missed out on in the last few years. Um, but what uh, is really exciting for me and what I've been doing um, since 2017 at UC Santa Cruz is thinking about ways that we can um, strengthen the astronomy community and, and targeted parts of the astronomy community through varying degrees of programs that address the astronomy workforce or um, individual professional skills. Um, so the structure of the talk is, I'll talk a little bit about um, workforce development and some of the goals around that uh, and give one example of a program we've run that addresses some of those. Um, similar structure for professional development, I'll talk about um, some of the ways that professional development can be defined as effective and a couple of examples of programs that um, we hope are going in that direction. Um, and then if there's time at the end, um, mainly for grad students and postdocs in the audience, um, I can give a few personal notes on the transition from doing astronomy research to doing something that is not astronomy research. Uh, I know that's relevant generally to a lot of people, so um, if I have time to say something about it, fine, and if not, then that's a great topic for lunch or grad students, et cetera. Um, so that's the overall thing, and the only one thing I want to emphasize other overall contextually is that um, having switched to this professional development space two years ago, um, there's some things that I know very well. Uh, I was working with the organization I worked for uh, to lesser degrees than full time since 2008, so there are some things that I feel very well versed in, and there are other things where there are probably examples that I don't have at my fingertips, and so I'm giving you one avenue into this kind of space, and there are other things that um, are probably relevant things that I'll have to gloss over. Um, so why workforce development? I thought um, to illustrate sort of the scale at which science happens in astronomy today, I would go with the most relevant example, uh, or the most topical one right now. And so um, this amazing discovery, or the amazing achievement of imaging uh, the shadow of a supermassive black hole is a project that has spanned many years, many countries, many institutions, um, and it's essentially an experiment with, so far, like two science targets. Um, so you have something on the scope of this and the degree to which it is both interdisciplinary in terms of combining the engineering you need to actually achieve the measurement and all of the theory that goes behind uh, interpreting what the data are and the science that you do with it. Um, all of those things represent challenges that um, an individual going through a single graduate program is going to be equipped to deal with some aspects of these and will have to learn other skills professionally on the fly. Um, and then Event Horizon Telescope is one experiment. You can compare it to something like LSST, which has science goals it's trying to achieve, and also has just sort of open domain parameter space where discoveries are gonna come to fruition. So there are scales of discovery and collaboration that in some ways are even more complicated and have even more open-ended possibilities than something like EHU. Um, just some examples, and, and this is almost, it got close to being a list of things that I wish I had learned in graduate school and didn't, uh, of the kinds of disciplinary expertise that um, have to be pulled from various places, and in some cases learned on the job, uh, are things like data science, machine learning, software development in a very communal sense or open source sense, uh, and then time domain, and, and especially the last few years of LIGO, multi-messenger astronomy are things that are going to be changing the shape of what we do and changing how we need to prepare our workforce to answer the most interesting questions a few years from now, uh, and many years beyond that. Um, and then certainly uh, one of the long-standing and ongoing challenges for developing a workforce that can do science most effectively, uh, and in the way that's the most meaningful and relevant for society at large, is um, changing some very long-standing trends with the demographic representation of astronomy, physics, and related fields. Um, so there are many different uh, compilations of demographic data on who is participating in physics and astronomy. Um, this particular one is from Aura, which is the organization that runs many major observatories. And so this is, um, in many ways, kind of a slice of uh, a typical telescope-related workforce. Um, and you can see that uh, in just about every one of the categories, and especially kind of the scientific and technical categories of the Aura workforce, um, 
there are more white men than there are in the U.S. population at large. Um, this trend probably isn't surprising to many people, but it's something that uh, has been persistently difficult to overturn, and with time, we hope that we're going to be able to do that. Um, and then just sort of boiling down the graphs that are hard to interpret, um, overall, sort of these middle stem ranges for aura comprise 25% women and 9% underrepresented minorities. Um, it's not simply a matter of making science and astronomy and physics sufficiently interested that people who currently are not represented well within the field become interested and then enter the field. Once they are in the field, more work has to be done in order to keep moving them uh, and allowing them persist to persist in a way. And so there's a lot of evidence that um, solving issues with representation isn't just a matter of changing who comes in, but it's also changing cultures and changing uh, the way that we work so that it is fair for the people who are already interested and already part of the discipline. Um, then if we switch gears quickly, um, sort of on a more individualized scope from workforce development, uh, you can think about professional development, which are the kinds of things that uh, a person might go through in order to be a more effective worker at whatever role they are. Um, and so this is uh, a report that was commissioned by the federal government uh, in 2012, um, and that examined some of the challenges to uh, making United States science and engineering as effective as it could be. Uh, and one of the things they identify is that for PhD level people, uh, there are a lot of things that you do learn in the PhD program that are very relevant and useful. Uh, and there are a lot of things that you are going to probably have to find in other forms of education or uh, on-the-job training, such as uh, project management, leadership, working in teams, solving interdisciplinary problems, and teaching. Um, and there are ways that graduate programs support this, and there are ways that can be improved upon. Um, and this is relevant whether you're looking to become a faculty member somewhere or you're looking to be uh, an engineer in an industry firm. These skills are still relevant. Um, and then the other thing I want to stress, and this relates again to uh, thinking about demographics and the various ways that uh, our community needs to be supported in order to have persistence of people equally no matter where they're coming from, uh, is that as someone navigating a career path in astronomy and physics, you interact with many of your colleagues and your colleagues are going to be your mentors, people who lead your collaborations, people who collaborate with you. Um, and that there are ways to practice these leadership and mentorship skills well um, that can directly help the overall problems of representation. Um, so that's another area of professional development that can be very valuable uh, to the big picture. So just a little bit of background for people who, um, for good reason, aren't familiar with the Institute for Scientists and Engineer Educators, who I'm sort of representing today. Uh, we started as the sort of educational branch of the Center for Adaptive Optics, which was uh, an NSF science and technology center for 10 years, starting in 2001. Um, and as the NSF funding for that center was winding down and we had begun um, developing a very successful series of programs, we were able to spin off as a UC Santa Cruz um, funded program. And so we're currently located at UC Santa Cruz and have been our own uh, research entity there uh, since 2008. Uh, Lisa, director, Lisa Hunter is our director, uh, and then CFAO continues as a UC research organization. Um, and so we started doing professional development. We, we early on identified that um, the area where we could in some ways make the most impact through uh, science and technology was focusing on uh, college level education and training for graduate students. Uh, and so working with graduate students and college level students was a niche at the time um, that has sort of driven the directions that we've gone for almost 20 years now. Um, our funding is put together, uh, we have some support from UC Santa Cruz, but rely on a lot of other funders um, to run various programs and um, keep the lights on. Uh, and so these are the organizations that we're grateful to have supporting us. Uh, I'll talk specifically about some of our work with the 30 meter telescope in particular. Um, and then sort of the way that our overall scope of things is structured is uh, we have initiatives that kind of represent larger, long-term things that we're trying to work toward. Um, they usually then encompass some of these smaller programs and projects. The programs can be quite large. Um, it takes several people to run a program on an annual cycle. Um, and then projects can be anything from a small semester-long research project to find a particular outcome of a particular thing uh, or something that involves more data. Um, but this is kind of how our organization is structured. Um, I'm one of five full-time employees, including the director, and we have uh, a few part-time employees, but it's a relatively small 
institution within the scope of UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so one of the projects that we're doing, uh, because this is a decadal survey this year, is um, some of the work I'm presenting is directly related to a couple of the position papers that uh, Lisa Hunter and I are writing on these topics of workforce development and professional development and strategy. Uh, and if anyone is really interested about this to the degree that they want to potentially collaborate on some of these position papers, um, they are not in final draft form yet. We have until sometime in the summer. Um, so definitely talk to me if, if this is something that you think is interesting to you. Okay, workforce development. Um, so it's, it's helpful if you're thinking about workforce development to define the astronomy workforce. Um, and it's good to think pretty broadly. If, if you start by thinking about it in a departmental context, you'll pick up on some of the standard roles that you have in an apartment here. Um, if you switch to thinking about an observatory or a telescope, then you add on roles like support staff and engineers. Um, IT people serve both things, and, and there may be more directly of an astronomy workforce component at a telescope, but um, they're there. Um, the kinds of workplaces, of course, include colleges and universities, but we also have staff at labs, observatories, um, national offices, the AAS officers are part of the astronomy workforce. Um, and more and more people who are doing work um, as soft money researchers are in a freelance role. Um, so these are the various kinds of people that we can think about serving through the astronomy workforce. Um, and thinking very broadly, if you want to be part of a specific project or an organization that is going to try to address some workforce elements, you're not going to be able to fix everything, but it really helps you identify and bullet out the kinds of outcomes that you hope that you might be able to see. Um, and so there are a range of outcomes from what individuals can achieve as a result of the program you're running or interaction with your organization. Um, you can think about changes in demographic composition, uh, either for a field, if you're thinking very broadly, or for, uh, for instance, with respect to that aura data for a particular organization. Um, and you can think within an organization about change in terms of <coughs> the goals that are set by the organization, the culture of the organization, um, and the ways that people within the organization are able to advance. Um, and so this list here comes from a meeting that we held um, funded by TMT um, in December at TMT headquarters in Pasadena. There was a GMT representative there. And so um, this was a piece of the work informing the ongoing TMT, GMT, NOAO collaboration. Um, so this is our small role so far in the process of trying to think about how you actually define what success would look like in an attainable way for workforce development. Um, one example of a program that's been running for quite some time and actually has um, shown demonstrated success in some of these metrics is the Akamai Workforce Initiative, which is an internship program that we run in Hawaii, uh, internship and mentor training program in Hawaii. Uh, and so I'll go through um, some of the features of Akamai that make it particularly successful, uh, and these are kind of some of the bullets that it is serving well, at least in its running so far. So Akamai was conceived back when IC was part of CFAO, um, and this was conceived directly to address some of the unique challenges that Hawaii has um, and that many other telescopes were located in relatively remote places have uh, in terms of supplying the local workforce. Um, so there are multiple summits in the Hawaiian Islands that have telescopes uh, and many observatories on those, um, but there is not sufficient, at this time, local people to have certain technical roles that these observatories are having to bring in technical staff and astronomers um, from outside of the Hawaiian Island. Um, and those people don't always stay with the same rate that people from Hawaii do. And at the same time, you have people who are growing up in Hawaii, are interested in STEM, and understandably want to know what's the best pathway they can have to have a career in the place that they grew up. Um, at the same time, there are um, many of the same demographic issues that astronomy and physics and engineering as a whole have. Uh, in particular, 10% of observatory engineers is uh, quite a bit worse than engineering on average. Um, and then um, Native Hawaiians are definitely not represented equally in the STEM workforce in Hawaii. And so these are the overall challenges that um, Hawaii and Hawaii observatories need to address over time. Uh, if you think about it sort of in a national scale and, and what does it mean for someone who's starting a college program to persist in STEM, uh, the numbers don't look so great there either. So of U.S. students who come into college interested in pursuing STEM, those that leave with a degree in STEM, no matter who they are, are well under 50%. Um, 
Um, and then, of course, there are disparities between different time groups of people in terms of the rate at which they are able to persist in STEM just to the completion of the degree. So this is sort of the national level backdrop that goes behind the challenge of building a good workforce for the students in Hawaii. So the, the Akamai program, and Akamai is the Hawaiian word meaning smart or clever. Uh, so the Akamai program was started in 2003. Uh, it was basically conceived as an internship program that would help um, place and fund interns to do summer projects at uh, originally the observatories in Hawaii and as the programs got grown um, other high-tech STEM industries on Maui and on the Big Island. Um, so far we've had over 400 intern participants. Uh, through recruiting and through selection we try very hard to have the demographics of the Akamai cohort represent uh, the overall population of Hawaii more so than uh, who is currently in STEM engineering positions in Hawaii. Uh, and so we're able to do that, uh, not entirely with women, we're pretty close for Native Hawaiian people, and, and these are the ways that we try to serve the program. Um, and what it looks like is, uh, in, in a basic sense, it's a summer internship, um, mostly at observatories, and we do some additional things. One thing is that we have uh, an optional mentoring workshop for the mentors to learn effective mentoring practices before they get an intern. Uh, in a given year, maybe a half to two-thirds of the mentors choose to take the workshop. Um, and we also have some structural components. Um, this is what I call a typical national REU or summer research program. And I'm sure there are some that do, that look more like this model up top than down here. Um, but whereas most research programs have some kind of mentored project and a showcase of what you achieved, um, Akamai has those two things as the centerpiece of the program. Uh, we also have an ongoing communication course uh, throughout the summer and, and other forms of career development that have dedicated program managers invested in the training the interns. We have a one-week prep course for the interns starting off uh, the summer program, which gives them kind of an introduction to some basic research and professional skills um, so they can do more specified research and hit the ground running. Um, and then one of the main differences between Akamai and a typical RIU program is the pool of students that we're drawing from. Uh, and so whereas RIUs can be very competitive, they're drawing students that already may have some research experience that have a very definite eye toward a graduate career. Um, Akamai goes for students who actively recruit at Hawaii's community colleges, and we accept students who are uh, only two years of community college. Um, we do look at students' GPAs, and we certainly pay attention to what they're doing in their courses and who's vouching for them, but we try not to be cutting ourselves off uh, in terms of demanding that a student have very high academic performance in order to have an opportunity to do one of these projects. So we've been doing this, uh, as I said, for almost 17 years now, and a few years ago, uh, my colleagues Austin Barnes is the uh, IC program manager who runs Akamai, began doing a tracking study to catch up with people who had been in the program since 2003 or, or more recently, um, and actually measure how many of them are continuing on in STEM, either in a degree program or in an actual career role. Um, and to be able to break down the people we tracked, we would looked at things like gender, uh, racial or ethnic background, uh, whether we brought them into the program from a community college or they were already in a four-year institution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we were able to locate at the time uh, a pretty large fraction of the people that had originally gone through the program. Um, and the results compared to the national levels are actually really striking. We have 70% of them after going through Akamai and completing their degree um, entered in the workforce and continue to be in the STEM workforce. Uh, not all 70% of these people are in Hawaii, but a very good fraction of them are. Um, and then 17% of them, even after three years after the program, are still continuing either uh, an undergraduate or a graduate degree in STEM. Um, and so just to put that up against the national numbers, with a really dedicated program with attention to um, supporting and retaining particular individuals and giving them relevant experience in the careers that they want, um, we can, at least for this sample of people, do very much better than the national persistence statistics uh, and have virtually no gap between uh, interns of different backgrounds in terms of whether they're in STEM today. Um, more on the anecdotal side, sort of where are these people who are persisting in STEM through Akamai going? Um, many of them, in fact, are being able to be employed at the telescopes in Hawaii. Uh, and so this is kind of an N equals one from an organizational standpoint. Um, but if we look at the engineers who are working on the DKIST solar telescope, which will be operational very soon, 
uh, on Maui, uh, again, before Akamai started, it was around 10% of engineering staff at Telescope for women. I'm not saying that 25% is where we want to be, but it's better than 10%. Um, and four of these women have been hired into the program after going through Akamai uh, and are, in fact, finding jobs that enable them to stay in Hawaii if they want to. Um, and then the last thing to say is that um, having a community of mentors that takes the aspect of mentoring these interns um, seriously is a very important part of Akamai's success. Uh, and so we've had the mentor workshop going since 2012. Uh, and so far I've had almost 100 mentors from Maui and the Big Island participate in this, and many of these people take interns summer after summer. Um, and we've recently established an Akamai Mentor Council, which is basically helping us get even more buy-in from other people at those organizations. Um, and also gives us good feedback in terms of how we can make uh, the overall program experience easier to get mentors engaged and involved. Um, one of the main takeaways that I want from this is not like, look, we did a great thing, although I think it really was a good success. Um, but what is required to do something like this is different from what is often where the resources come from to do this. Uh, and so in a lot of organizations, workforce development and education public outreach are put into the same pool, same budget, same leadership. Um, and both of these are very important things that a project needs to have. Um, but they, in practice, don't often involve the connections being made with the same people and the kind of programs being run being similar. And so I do want to underscore that in order to make Akanai work, we had to have really deep relationships with people doing really technical work. Um, one of the reasons the program is successful is we put an amazing amount of person effort into finding that each intern comes into a project that is going to be well suited for them appropriate for the skills they're bringing in is going to be challenging enough that they come away with uh, an experience that they actually grow from. Um, and that takes a relevant amount of technical expertise and it takes a lot of time and attention. Um, we also need STEM faculty who are able to help recruit students at various institutions in Hawaii. Um, and so this is an example from Akamai, but it comes up uh, in other programs that we run, is that the kinds of infrastructure that is often in place for education and public outreach is really good for those purposes and for serving other audiences, but for doing a workforce development program, it's a different kind of work and a different kind of connection that you make. Um, and so separating these things in terms of budget and leadership can be really beneficial, both to workforce development and to education and public outreach. And it's one of the directions that we'd love to see projects go. Um, so thinking sort of in the decadal survey sense, um, these white papers are drafts, but some of the recommendations for um, sort of at an institutional level is if you're thinking about workforce development, Determine what exactly it is that um, success would look like and what the indicators are to let you know that you're moving in the right direction if you haven't hit the final outcome yet. Um, to separate resources and all of the good things that you want to dedicate to workforce development from education and public outreach and allow those things to work the best in each of their own respective domains. Um, if an institution doesn't yet have something as simple as a value statement indicating to its employees that it values inclusion and workforce development, um, that is the kind of thing that if established at a high level can drive decisions that are made later on and can actually be a good thing to have. Um, and if you're doing work to try to make your workplace more inclusive, there is a certain level of transparency that's needed. Um, and so if you're doing this good work, report it. Understand that it, you know, it takes time to progress and so be comfortable reporting the outcomes of, of where you are. Um, for larger scale things, um, especially in the scope of um, big observatory collaborations coming together, it can be really valuable to think about what the workforce development plan of a project is going to be as the project is being designed, not at first light. Um, and so give yourself the same on-ramp for developing a really excellent workforce development plan as you would for um, developing a really excellent science program for the facility that you want to do. Um, and funding agencies could and should demand that. All right, uh, so that's my spiel on workforce development and uh, I'll switch to professional development and I kind of just wanted to ask people, um, what sorts of experiences have you had in your career that you would consider professional development? Yeah? I worked for 19 uh -oh. years as a software guy. Okay, so that, that... It was with astronomers though. Okay, so you had a vocation for many years that is now directly applicable to your job. Yeah, that's 
Lisa? Uh, the Tech Visiting Scholar Program and the LSSP Data Science Fellowship. Okay. I don't know the details of those, but those both definitely sound like plausible professional development opportunities. Some of the workshops that go like that happened before. Yeah, the OAS workshops, that's a, that's a nice finite, come a day early and learn something. We had a few courses and lots of, lots of seminars on better, better teaching and, and student mentoring. Okay, yeah, courses, seminars. All relevant forms of professional development. Um, some of them, and, and I'm sure people with individual experiences can speak to whether the things that you've received are effective or not. Uh, some forms of professional development generally tend to be more effective than others. Um, and when we think about what makes professional development effective or not effective, what we're actually looking for is, do you then take the things you learn and apply them in your practice, and apply them in your practice more than once? Years later, are you still doing things the way that you've been uh, trained to do it? Um, and also, do you take the things that you learn and apply them appropriately? Um, and so here's a couple of quotes about the sort of features that enable professional development. Someone mentioned workshops before the AAS. Uh, Ed and Gina run a pretty well-known in astronomy teaching development program, and so this is kind of their endorsement for uh, rigorous professional development. Um, and one of the connections is if, if you think about yourself as a physics or astronomy instructor, and you think about how you want your students to demonstrate that they're capable people in knowing physics or knowing astronomy, uh, it's similar things to the things quoted here, right? You want them to have uh, an understanding of the concepts that allow them to use an equation instead of just plugging in the equation by trial and error. Um, you want them to be able to take a concept and apply it appropriately to different kinds of problems and circumstances um, instead of knowing just always run through the checklist of how to do this problem. And so maybe it doesn't surprise anyone that these are also the characteristics that you want in professional development. Um, if you go into the research space and look at um, either empirical studies for we tried doing this particular kind of training program and intervention, and we measured how well people gained the skills we wanted and this is what they did, um, or more theoretical or kind of uh, meta-study space of uh, how learning works is a really excellent uh, book uh, that draws from decades worth of uh, education research uh, and talks about the things that you need to do to get someone to learn effectively. Uh, this is mostly in the context of a college student, but a lot of the things are relevant to professionals learning too. Um, and so one of the, and I would say the number one thing for professional development is that it's not just being told how to do something, it's being given an opportunity to then put it into practice. Um, and not just like being wound up and sent on your own to put it into practice and figure out for yourself whether it's working or not, but actually having ongoing interaction with people who can give you feedback on how well you're doing, suggest ways to uh, approach it, and talk with you about your process of implementing. So this is an essential characteristic of good professional development. Um, it's related to some of these uh, overall concepts for how learning works, um, and especially in teacher training modes. Uh, the, the notion of an external coach, someone who isn't just your peer who also took the same program and now you're teaching each other how to do it, but someone who has expertise in what they're trying to teach you to do and expertise in effective teaching um, can really help make the experience. Um, Probably not a surprise, it requires substantial time investment from the person who's doing the professional development for it to really stick. Uh, 19 years is maybe the most extreme case that I've heard. Um, but if you think on the spectrum from decades of career experience into something that's now relevant for a new career to a one hour seminar someone gives with you know, tips for how to use clickers in your classroom. Um, actually putting in the time to try things that work, understand why things work and do it right, uh, is in some cases an obstacle, um, and in other cases just a sense of what you need to invest in order to be effectively trained. Um, and then something else that is really relevant for professional development is that it be disciplinary based grounded. So the more that, and this has to do with implementation, the more that you can implement something in a context that's relevant to how you've learned it, and learn it in a context that's relevant to how you're going to implement it, um, the more effective that this is likely to be. Um, and so for people who have a little bit of understanding of um, concepts around learning, uh, knowing that activating your students' prior knowledge and helping your students create organizational structures by which they can appropriately access their knowledge in a way that's closer to expertise, um, this is something that is much easier when the thing that you're learning is steeped in a discipline where you already have prior knowledge and you already have um, your own expert level organization of how things work. 
Um, one point on this is that it can be a challenge for implementing professional development when uh, you need importance of external coaching, so people who are able to have expertise in helping professionals learn things and also have expertise enough in a discipline to be able to have that be disciplinarily relevant. Um, so that can, I admit, be a real challenge. Um, I'm fortunate to work in a group that um, has that combination of expertise, and so a couple of programs that we've done um, that I don't have as many outcomes to show as I did for Akamai, but uh, at least these are highly aligned with the characteristics that I just showed. Uh, the first one is the Professional Development Program, or PDP, which obviously you know what skills are being gained if we call it the Professional Development Program. Um, but it was within the context of CFAO, uh, and its main skill set is effective and inclusive teaching. Um, and its main audience is graduate students and postdocs. Faculty are eligible to participate in PDP. Um, a relatively low fraction of faculty do, and, and that's fine. Um, we mainly aim at grad students and postdocs. And for its duration, it's always had astronomy involved over the years based on departments from UCSC funding it. It's evolved in terms of who is represented. Uh, and so these days, it's about two-thirds astronomy and one-thirds drawing from a very wide range of STEM fields. Uh, mostly serving UC Santa Cruz. Um, and one of the aspects of this program is you go through it the first year, you get fire hose with a lot of pedagogy, you put some of it into practice, a lot of it is still, you know, wheeling around in your mind. Uh, the second year is a really great opportunity to come back and crystallize some of those things you learned the first year. Um, and recently, with some NSF support, it's an opportunity to um, build in some leadership skills. We have you um, lead a team and we are actively working on our support in developing theoretical con conceptual leadership training to help you learn the skills of um, The structure of the program is, uh, it's more than sort of that 50 hour threshold. It's a four day workshop where the entire cohort of participants uh, comes together and, and, and learn some of the things that they're going to have to implement. Um, it's followed up by a two day workshop and these are two different workshops that half of the cohort goes to each. Um, and at this point, people are in teams of three or four people, and they're working together to uh, design and teach a laboratory activity for a group of undergraduate students. Uh, and so they spend time with staff there coaching them, working on the design of their activity. Um, usually some design has to continue after that second workshop, and then eventually they teach the activity. Uh, and after that, we have them reflect on what they did, uh, and we have a number of questions by which we evaluate how effectively they're able to integrate the concepts that we've been teaching into their own teaching. Um, so again, the structure is when someone is accepted to the program, they are accepted on a team, and we already know where that team is going to be teaching and where the undergraduate learners and the activity are going to come from. Um, so being in the program guarantees that you're going to have an opportunity to put what you learn into practice. Um, again, the returning participant leads each team, and so our first stage is to find the people who are going to be team leaders, and then later on we accept all of the first-time participants um, so that we know that we can continue by this structure, uh, and the returners are getting leadership support, which they then get to put into practice by leading a team. Uh, and then at the end of all of it, uh, sort of the reflection reporting part, we try to tune this as much as possible to a teaching statement or the kind of thing that you would actually pull out and use in a professional context or applying for a job context. Um, and what we're trying to do is really assess the essential things that we hope people are learning in the program. So this is an example of one of three or four prompts that everyone answers in essay form at the end of the, the program. And it's getting at uh, the things that are really at the core of identifying what is important in a concept and whether after your attempt at teaching it, you were successful or not so that you can retool it for as needed for the next time. Um, from a big picture sense, uh, if you think about this in the context of workforce development, it's actually uh, in some ways hitting two different directions that we want to go for workforce development. The main thrust of it is professional training for um, early career scientists and engineers um, that will enable them to either obtain jobs if they have an educational focus or be effective at jobs they have even if they're in more of a research faculty group or an industry mentor teaching people in a workplace setting. Um, because we have the program built around these teaching experiences where we bring in undergraduates, it also gives us an opportunity to um, 
take a group of undergraduates that uh, may be underserved in some way or um, is integrated into an REU program or a different program uh, and give them, albeit a one-time experience, something that has been designed with um, these really effective teaching principles in mind. Uh, and so there, you, know, you can argue to how much we're doing this effectively, but it is one piece of a larger puzzle that people can encounter various experiences and hopefully they build up and lead to persistence and stand for undergraduates. Um, in terms of how the program is, uh, how we select our pool of graduate students and postdocs who come in, uh, we currently are structured with a chapter network and so people at these institutions uh, are especially welcome to apply. Everyone is technically eligible to apply, but for kind of co-funding reasons, we really prioritize people coming from these institutions. Um, and the structure works well because someone who has been through the program and advanced to a faculty job is at each one of these institutions and has come to us and said, I'm interested in giving graduate students in my department this opportunity, and I'm willing to help recruit them, and I'm willing to help set up a teaching venue. And so a lot of the local infrastructure to allow the program to exist um, is driven by alumni from the program. Uh, for a while, that included Texas A&M. Uh, Peachy was a participant, and that's the only one I see in the room. Um, but it's been a few years. Unfortunately, um, Ryan Quadri was great as a chapter lead, but he was also a postdoc, and so when he left, that connection and the ability to keep things going here kind of withered. Um, but we've had a great experience with um, a number of graduate students and postdocs who were in the department a few years ago. Um, their teaching venue was the RU program here at Texas A&M. And so if you know any of these people or if you want to mob Tichi after the, Tichi after the talk and, and ask him how it went, um, that's sort of the local background to this. Um, and in terms of the people who have gone through PDP, we've had um, 662. I think this includes faculty too, so it's maybe closer to 630 grad students and postdocs uh, over 19 years of the programs. Uh, for those of them who have uh, advanced to a career position, about half of them are in an academic faculty type position and about half of them are in industry. Um, and this is where they're located in the US and a handful are international. Um, I will pause for breath and to check time and that looks okay. Are there any questions about the stuff I've done so far before I launch into a second example of a professional slash workforce developer? And so I'm gonna pause it so to choose we, we it's not we don't exactly have a library of things they can choose from but whatever their awareness is of things that have previously been designed either because they were on the team designing it a year ago um, or because they say you know I really want to teach this spectroscopy content and we say well yeah there's these successful activities that you can start from um, some people from a time management point of view definitely want to start with something that exists and make it better and um, if something, in fact, that's relevant to them does exist, then that's fine, and other people want to be very creative and start from scratch, and, and we also need that. All right. Um, this is another uh, professional slash workforce development program we run. This one is much newer. Uh, we started in 2016, and this is the 30 meter telescope early career initiative or techie. Uh, it serves, again, graduate students and postdocs. Uh, and one of the primary goals of this program is to bring in, in roughly equal numbers, people from each of the major TMT partners. Uh, and so far we've had three iterations of the program, uh, totaling 112 participants. Uh, the goals for TMT when they came and, and worked with us to develop this program were, um, they're of course thinking ahead to the science and future instruments that are going to be built with TMT after first light, so 10 or more years from now. Um, and recognizing that the scientific workforce that they want to be most equipped to build the best instruments and do the best science are people who are graduate students and postdocs now. Um, and so preparing these people to be able to do uh, the best that they possibly can a decade or so from now is something that requires early career development. Um, they also have um, major concerns, not in a bad way, but just they're very concerned about how to get people from five different countries to work together and collaborate on such a large project. Uh, and so finding ways to make sure that the scientific pe uh, people and, and the engineering people in the project are making the best use of the strengths that people from very geographically disparate regions bring uh, is another aspect of the project that um, they're interested in in the long range. Uh, 
Uh, and that too speaks to early career people because they're going to be working in the program. Um, so again, we bring in graduate students and postdocs from all the CMT partners, and uh, there's almost no focus on teaching in this program at all. This is now professional development around um, large projects and particular projects that involve both scientists and engineers. Uh, and so we have some major activities in this program that talk about defining what you need to do scientifically and then defining the requirements for an instrument that is going to achieve that and negotiating the interface between those two, uh, not two different priorities, but people who have one set of language and disciplinary expertise having to coordinate their goals with uh, people from another discipline. Uh, we talk a lot uh, and have people work on a lot of uh, collaboration within the workshop. Um, and so there's the challenge in some ways of just collaborating on a team with two other grad students from your institution to build a teaching activity. There are other challenges with having a scientist, an engineer, a different kind of engineer working together when all three of them are from a different country. Um, so we would address that. Um, and then project management is something that um, it requires a lot of formal training to be you know, a true master of project management, um, but even familiarity with project management and the basic way that it has to proceed in order to get a large project done uh, is something that's very valuable for scientists and engineers to have internalized at least at some level. And so we try to give people a taste of that as well. Uh, the structure of the program is in some ways similar to PDP, although at this point the only mandatory part is the week-long workshop where we bring people together for this. Uh, starting this uh, actually, starting this January, we've instituted an option where people who begin working on some of these projects in the workshop um, have an opportunity to propose to, and if they propose a feasible plan, continue working on projects. Um, afterwards, we have some funding for travel awards so that people can go to a, a, either meet at the TMT project office, or if there's an engineering facility or a lab facility somewhere, people from other partners on the project team can go and work together in place. Uh, and that's a great networking opportunity to build the kind of connections that TMT wants to build in its early career workforce. Um, and so these are opportunities that are still pretty much being developed right now, but we're in our first year where people are actually starting to do this part of it. Um, and we call these mini projects. They are projects that are relevant to TMT. I'll flash forward for a second. And so these are all examples of things that we have teams of people who have at least started doing at the workshop, and in the case of about half of them have proposed to do advanced work on them for. Um, they're mini to varying degrees. Some of them are, are probably mini projects for what you can do in a year and then could imagine becoming integrated into more of a long-term project. Um, but they're things of direct value for TMT. And so by investing time, um, not necessarily as part of one's thesis research and working on one of these projects, you are integrating yourself and creating cachet in a community of this collaboration that is looking for future engineers and scientists to continue doing work that's relevant for TMT. Um, so that's sort of the incentive for it. Um, and we orchestrate the teams who work on these projects so that it requires a certain degree of international collaboration. We don't let three people from Caltech define a mini project team and work on that mini project. Um, that meets some but not all of the goals of the Techie program, and so we're careful about how these teams are uh, designed. Um, so with those examples in mind and others that um, I don't have time to talk about, recommendations related to professional development, um, a basic one, invest resources toward it. Make sure that um, if you have a department or institution that can set aside some um, time for faculty to spend on professional development instead of just always having a constant teaching load uh, or other ways to support training for graduate students or postdocs, whether it's the funding to sign up for one of those one-day workshops before AAS, um, that's important. Something that departments, uh, depending on departments across the country, can often do much better is to realize that being a TA uh, is more than just having a bunch of undergraduates and needing to get those undergraduates from the start to the finish. I know that in itself is challenging, but it's also a really good professional development role for the person who's a TA. Um, at Texas A&M, you have the, uh, I think it's the Center for Educational Excellence, Academic Excellence, something for that. Many universities, including this one, have a center that does training in how to teach effectively uh, and there may be various ways to coordinate with that and use their resources to help professionally develop the people who have to teach in your department to start. Um, and then uh, thinking back to sort of inclusive leadership and inclusive mentoring and some of the things I didn't speak as specifically about in examples, um, if you're at the point where you have an institutional goal around inclusion um, and you have things that you would like to see accomplished, realize that professional development and making people's individual practices more inclusive 
is one legitimate way to help move you along your overall uh, goal for diversity and inclusion. Uh, and so take advantage of that opportunity where, where you're able to. Um, and then in terms of sort of large projects and sort of a national scope, uh, this is the workforce development recommendation for before. Um, and you know, to the extent that funding agencies, for instance, are funding programs related to workforce and professional development or want to see an educational component. Now, again, education and public outreach can be a, a perfectly legitimate way to build that part of a broader impacts proposal, for instance, for NSF. Um, but to the extent that something is really aligned with professional development, fund ones that aren't short, one-off, relatively ineffective ways to do it, but try to actually have support for finding the ones that are uh, aligned with research on how to do this effectively, um, and also that have outcomes and know what they're going to do to demonstrate that they've been done effectively. Um, and when that includes things around inclusion, then make sure if you're running a professional development program that you have inclusion in mind is one of the things you'd like to see that accomplish. How much time do I have? Um, maybe another five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, perfect. Um, this is not Nicholas writing a white paper for the McHale survey. This is just sort of Nicholas who has been in two years worth of this work, seeing people struggle with things multiple times. Um, so for someone who is an individual who has identified something that you want to do better uh, and maybe has found an opportunity where you can learn something and then try to put it into practice, um, some of the ways that you can increase your odds of doing so successfully are um, to think for yourself really reflectively, what is it going to look like when I do this well? In which case then you know, am I there yet? Do I need to invest more time in it? What parts of it are the ones that are starting to work well and what parts are the ones that need more of my mental energy? Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, if you're learning something and, and something's being presented to you is like here's 10 tips for how to build a really inclusive classroom, that's great. They may work really well in the context that they're being presented to you. They might work really well in your classroom, but the more you can understand about why and what it is about the context that enables them to work well in the context you learn that will make you much more effective at deciding which one of them are going to be effective in a different context which one of them you should set down because it's just not relevant or could even be counterproductive if you're using it outside the scope of how it was trained to you. Um, and then finally, and I think this is this one comes up a lot for faculty who uh, are by their own initiative or by departments uh, demanding need to do something like flip the classroom and now I'm going to teach an active learning thing. Um, it doesn't always go great the first time. And when you try something that's brand new to you and you don't get the outcome that you want right away, it doesn't mean that the method that you tried is garbage. It means that many things have to have multiple attempts to work right. So as this is true in life, it's also true in trying new things professionally. So give yourself space to improve iteratively if you really can. Um, I'll pause again for questions if there are kind of questions on the big picture stuff, and then I can share some personal things for the people who are at all curious about whether um, a role in kind of professional training is interesting. Is there anyone here who is like remotely interested in maybe one day I would like to spend more of my time helping my colleagues do things better or teaching really effectively? Okay, enough hands that it's not meaningless for me to go forward. And, and wonderful, it's, I, I really think it's great that you're thinking just generally openly about the various things that you might do after this right now stage of your career. Um, so some things that really worked for me as I made the long and painstaking decision that um, even though I liked astronomy research, it wasn't actually what I wanted to do full time for my career to a thing that currently is going really well in terms of my sense of career satisfaction um, were some things. So these are things that were personally relevant to me is that I, at some point early in my first postdoc, kind of became attuned to the things that I really liked doing in the role and the things I didn't like so much. And I was beginning to notice that some of the things I really liked doing, like hosting seminar speakers, were not things that were incentivized to be successful in that particular role. But it was a data point. I said, OK, I, I like interacting with people in this particular way. Um, the, the sort of old chestnut is it's not what you know, it's who you know. This is very true in a lot of contexts. Um, in some cases, thinking about the people who you really want to emulate, um, whether that means talking to them directly and saying, tell me more about how you 
manage to do this thing very well that I notice you do very well. We're just kind of keeping tabs on these are the qualities of this person that I would like to strive for. Um, are really good, but it's also really good to have that apply in a variety of different situations. Um, I found that I drew from many different people and, and unique aspects of each of them instead of having one person who just was the single embodiment of who I wanted to be. Um, and think really broadly, uh, especially if you're thinking about potentially changing careers. Um, the resources that may be really valuable to you are probably many of them are outside of your department and can be connections that at first seem like relatively casual connections, but um, investing in those relationships and figuring out how they work for you can be really useful for making a switch later on. Um, this is something probably when you write it on a slide seems really obvious. Just because you haven't done something before doesn't mean that you're not good at it. I personally found that when I was looking at like jobs and listings of job requirements, I would very quickly be like, oh, I'm not, I can't do that. I'm not qualified for that job. Um, and I found that um, you know, experience is really important for some things, but there are a lot of roles that you can take where experience is something you learn as you do it. And don't sell yourself short, and definitely don't compromise the other kinds of skills that are relevant to that job. Um, so don't talk yourself down from a job that seems on the margin of being potentially relevant for what you can do. Um, and then something that I'm still trying to do better is, you know, there's a lot of background on professional development and on teaching that I wasn't digesting because I was studying galaxies and black holes. Um, and now I'm in a full-time job and I have deadlines to meet and I have things I have to do. And so finding the balance of being able to give myself time to become good at what I'm doing now instead of just doing it at the practice pace that I can uh, is something that can pay off and I'm still trying to um, if you're curious about the nitty gritty of like astronomy research versus other things, um, there are some similarities and some differences. Uh, these are often the kinds of things that come out of research that um, people will be looking to you and saying, I endorse this person because they've been very effective at publishing papers or creating really excellent tools that the community can use very easily. Um, it's a lot more personal in my realm of things. We think hard about what kind of individual experience we want people to have. That doesn't mean I want them to be happy at the end of my program. I do, but that's not how I define success. It's what have they learned? What are they going to be able to do as a result of going through the program? Um, thinking about how you develop a community, because community resources can really sustain something over time. Uh, even if your program manager burns out, a uh, community can be super important. And so that's something that I'm spending more time investing in than I was as a researcher. Um, and then there is a little bit of research in my role uh, based on trying to report out on outcomes or um, some people can even go further into theoretical research or social sciences around what are the aspects of this particular model that allow it to be so, so uh, successful in some cases. Uh, one of the things I like about being in the professional development thing is that there's like a very predictable feedback cycle. It's not try to publish papers fast, and if you don't publish it fast enough, then you're waiting that much longer to feel like you've accomplished something. Um, it's This program is going to run in March, whether I'm ready for it to run or not. Uh, and so it's every year I get a chance to um, get feedback on it and, and see how it goes, and it means that um, my role changes throughout the year for a given program. Um, so from recruiting to selection to developing the curriculum to actually doing it and thinking about the outcomes, I'm doing different phases of it per program throughout the year. Um, and then this is a big similarity. Uh, this last one is that I have multiple programs that I'm partially responsible for, and they're all going all at once to some degree. And, and likewise, as you advance in research, for sure, you're going to have multiple projects that are all going all at once. Um, so multitasking and time management are super valuable skills in both fields. Uh, and other practices that, um, if you are a graduate student or postdoc, you are already to some degree doing these things well. And that is something that is going to be part of your case for why you would be an excellent person in this career sector if you wanted to go that direction, uh, are things like planning and executing projects, um, thinking very carefully about evidence. This doesn't always mean, you know, what's my Bayesian model for how well people learn this professional development thing. Um, but it means defining the question really well so I know that in some sense I'm running an experiment to see whether the thing I did uh, worked effectively, and I have to be able to measure that somehow. And so thinking about how you can tangibly measure outcomes uh, is a really valuable transfer skill in this domain. Um, working on teams that have expertise from different disciplines, super relevant. Um, leading teams, leading team meetings, 
Uh, how many people have been in a bad meeting before? How many people are in good meetings more often than they're in bad meetings? Okay, that's that's awesome. Okay, at least some of you don't suffer through every meeting you're in. Um, but doing this well can make your team work really much more effectively, um, and hopefully, people who are looking for good uh, good workplace environments will value that you can do that well. Um, communication important in this domain as anything. Uh, and certainly securing funding is something that we spend um, probably a similar amount of effort doing as you would as a faculty member trying to get research grants. Um, so that's both my personal and sort of institutional level advice. Uh, I just want to leave with a quote. Darren Norman, uh, who's a senior scientist at NOAO, uh, has, has been involved in um, diversity and inclusion efforts at NOAO and at Aura for a while uh, has a quote that I really like, which is just a reminder that science doesn't happen without the people doing the science. And so um, professional development and workforce development have to play a role in moving the community forward because without it, we just we don't get the work done. So that's all. That's a really good question. Um, how, how to unpack my answer to it. So one thing is that the mentor training aspect of it isn't a huge time commitment. It's like a two-day workshop. Um, where the mentors first interface with us, the potential mentors, uh, and where we actually have a lot that we can use to evaluate, not necessarily the mentor's abilities, but whether the project is likely to be a successful experience for the intern, is when we select the interns, we pair them with the project. So as we are getting applications from interns, we're also getting applications from observatories and other companies saying, here's the list of projects we would like to have an intern come and do, please. Um, and their description of the project says a lot about, first of all, you know, you could cook up a project and if we have no applied math majors, then I'm sorry, your applied math project isn't gonna happen this year. And you could be the best mentor in the world and that's still where you're gonna land. Um, but we can tell the mentors who are at least invested enough to think through a project and describe it well enough that they have a sense of what concretely an intern is going to accomplish and what they're going to need in order to do it. Um, and that gives us a lot of information to make appropriate choices. And do you check in with the mentors as the program's going on? Or? Yeah, we do one formal check-in with the mentors halfway through the program. Um, many of these mentors are also repeat mentors, and so we have a, a group of probably a dozen or more people on the Big Island on Maui who want to have an intern every year and are bought in and, and you know they've done a lot of the legwork so they're they're not spending as much of their time relatively for the second, third, fourth time they're entering a project for the first time. Uh, so I mean I So I think if you add up all the people who sort of have part-time um, contracts with, it adds up to between six and seven FT, I think. I'm gonna say seven FT ballpark. Um, it is a lot. It, it's about as much as our funding supports. And so, you know, if we get some kind of big award, then that would enable us to, but of course awards come with needing to do something. So no one's going to give us extra money to have a more relaxed pace of doing the things we currently do. Uh, and, and yeah, it's hectic, but we find a way to make it work. And, and we actually, one of the things that was instrumental in me moving into this role is that, like I said, I started working with IC in 2008, and it's been a relatively small community for a lot of it. And so I knew personally the people I was going to be working with every day when I applied for and took the job. Um, and 
that definitely was a factor that helped me away whether I wanted the job, and it means that now that we're working together, we can work together really effectively. So um, there are only five of us, but I think we're, relatively speaking, a very efficient team in terms of the way we're able to do things. Uh, I was going to ask by proxy for anyone interested in PVP, as far as funding for travel, how much is there for or from where? Yeah, it's um, again with PDP where we are right now is, and this is evolving too. Um, we're trying to work on kind of established co-funding arrangements. We, we don't want the thing to entirely dry up if, goodness forbid, we don't get an NSF award. So we're trying to organize PDP a little bit around um, structures where maybe the funding is supporting a venue. Uh, and we have some funding coming from someone in the chapter who's able to do some fundraising and some funding coming from us at UC Santa Cruz to do it. Um, and so that means that we end up really prioritizing people who are from these chapters. And whereas the application is open for everybody when we do our first selection of who's going to be on the team, um, we're really unfortunately only looking at the people who are in those chapters and then as there are spots on those teams that we somehow can't manage to fill from within that existing co-funding structure then other people who have applied as open applicants then get considered those positions. Um, it's, it's the model we have right now, and I think there are ways if we started from scratch that maybe considering a much more national model where it's just completely open applicant pool uh, would help, but in terms of getting sustainable funding, we, we seem to be working in this model um, for the time being. So that goes to say, so I guess, and then in terms of timeline, we're in the middle of the program right now, so if anyone were hypothetically interested and applying to PDP, your application would be in January next year, so you've got some time to think about it. Um, and hypothetically, we'd invite you to apply any funding that you can get from your home institution. Um, it helps your case for being someone we consider, but um, currently, we first consider who's in our chapter network and then other people are interested. And that, that funding supports the, the travel, so I guess uh, on, the, on the institution side. Yeah, so, so some of it supports developing the program, so some of it goes in the mind while it is not as Some of it supports travel, and we have, when you're accepted to the program, you're accepted with a, a pretty clear way of, when you, sorry, when you apply to the program, we ask you how, many, how much of your own funds have, and you fill out a sheet saying, I can support this aspect of travel, I need IC to cover this aspect. And so at the point you're accepted to the program, you know what the package is going to be Support. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, let's thank you once again.